Final question I wanted to ask you. I'm not sure I can articulate it succinctly. Give it a, I'll give it a shot. So you you said you're 50, is that right? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, wonderful. I'm 49, so you're 50. All right. So as time has gone on and you've been practicing medicine and now you're, you, you seemingly are very much open-minded to holistic ways as well as traditional ways, Western, Eastern, et cetera, has your view on medicine and has your view on, say, big pharma um, changed over the years? Has has it changed? Are you more like very strict, like, yeah, traditional Western medicine is the way to go? Or are you less positive about that now and more open to holistic or Eastern medicine? Like how, how is yeah. your mindset around? Let me, yeah. let me give you a little bit more context before I give you an opportunity to answer. I know this is a long winded question, but there is certainly a feeling amongst many of my friends who are very holistic based that the American healthcare system in particular just wants us sick enough because there's so much money in it and it keeps the system going. They want us to pop a pill and doctors are influenced by big pharma trying to get them to write a, to give a pill to a patient when they walk in. And they're not spending the time digging in going, oh, this person has an alcohol use disorder. Let's have them stop drinking. Instead, they're wanting to just write a script because it's good for business, mm -hmm. right? So that's certainly the feeling amongst a lot of my friends and colleagues who are very health conscious. I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying my view is right or wrong. I'm just saying that tends to be the view of those who I spend time with. What is your view having spent, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, 30 years in the medical practice? Are those yeah. views warranted? Are they not? Just yeah, uh, I, I think there's some truth to all that. And yet you still have medications that you're, you're better off taking than not, just like because they, you know, I, I believe in science. Uh, let me say that. And, you know, I believe the COVID vaccine works. I believe like the polio vaccine works. And I think there's justification that's objective and not conflicted and not based on commercial interests in vaccinating everybody for this, that, and the other. And and that's an area that's, you know, been heavily challenged over the last couple decades. Childhood vaccines right up to who should get a COVID vaccine. But, you know, if you want polio, don't take the polio vaccine. You know, and we, we're seeing outbreaks in parts of the country, world rather, where, where polio vaccine uh, efforts have broken down. Uh, there's just like, you know, science has led to advancements and, and deeper understanding, and that includes medical science. And part of that is then inventing medical cures that 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 can really work and prolong uh, people's life expectancy and increase their quality of life. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have a long, healthy life without modern Western medicine. And certainly, you can talk about whether we should be spending all this time and effort on intensive end-of-life care or prescribing nine different medicines to everybody above the age of 65 versus is working on healthier communities, better food chain in terms of healthy food, more opportunities for exercise, less dependence on screens and kind of sedentary entertainment hours. All, all that is like, you know, kind of the modern capitalist country is not necessarily a healthy country. Um, and that and the medical establishment is kind of like part of that, but it's not the overall whole problem. So something like that, uh, I, I don't get paid more as a primary care doctor to write five prescriptions versus two prescriptions. There are certainly instances where doctors are directly incentivized to write more prescriptions by a particular pharmaceutical company. That, for the most part, those relationships are forbidden or are, are kind of stamped out pretty vigorously at the kind of place that I practice. But I would also acknowledge that there are, there are kind of perverse incentives all over medicine. And people do what they get paid to do. I'm paid to see patients, so I'm going to see a lot of patients. But I'm not going to to see more than I can handle. Uh, and I'm going to see enough so that I can keep my job. Surgeons generally are paid to do surgeries, you know, so you kind of get what you pay for throughout medicine. But I, I think it's generally rare that people are incentivized to like prescribe more drugs just to get people on more drugs or to, to keep them kind of sick. <laughs> like, I, I don't think anyone is, is consciously offering treatments with this kind of nefarious, sinister motivation to keep people unwell or to not to not help them. Uh, generally, the people I practice with are trying to help their patients. Uh, and then, and then when, look, let's look at the data. You know, there's there's many conditions where we don't have great treatments, but there's a lot of conditions where we do, and those came straight out of the science factory, and they're offered to you by you know people you don't really like, but they're wearing a white coat and they're called doctors. So again, like the colon cancer, uh, you know, we have very kind of well worked out kind of hierarchies of evidence about what works for a lot of different problems and 
you can avoid that if you have that condition, but chances are you won't do as well in terms of your outcomes if you totally avoid, um, you know, what we think um, is going to work. So, you know, uh, I, I find like the new obesity drugs fascinating. I don't prescribe a lot of that, but, you know, those are really taking over the GLP-1 analogs and they're helping a lot of people lose weight and keep weight off and control their diabetes a lot better. And they're extremely expensive and they're kind of blowing up the budgets of everybody's kind of like pharmacy benefit package. So should we pay for them? Should this many people be getting on Ozempic and Wagovi and, and the like? If I were overweight and struggling with diabetes, like I would want to be on them, but it's not going to be for everyone. But that's, you know, that's an opportunity. That's a new form of medication we didn't really have. They're branded products. They're incredibly expensive. They're making these companies trillions of dollars, probably when it's all said and done, but they might like really be improving the overall kind of population's health. And they might have done it through kind of a scientific discovery approach that seems to be working. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, I kind of, let's have that debate. Like, should anybody go on Ozempic? Because you can't just say, oh, you got to do everything else to lose weight. Because generally people can't find a way to lose weight um, once they have a serious kind of weight problem. It's just really hard. And we don't have like great solutions. And this one all of a sudden seems like a like a big winner. I'm all for prevention rather than cure. I'm sure that you would probably be that way inclined as well, Dr. Yeah, Lee. it's nice, except that most people over the age of 50 are overweight. So like the, mm. you, you don't, that opportunity for prevention is gone when you're seeing someone that already has the problem, right? Like I totally agree with prevention, but let's talk about people that are currently, you know, with chronic diseases linked to overweight. And then what are we going to do, you know, for that person?